This is Tommy Chong, man, and this is Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. It's Captain Hooter. happening everybody captain hooter here coming to you high and alive getting ready to have an amazing interview with a true cannabis legend mark emery i was trying to think about what would be the perfect game to open up this show for mark emery and i decided it would be this this is called the climb and mark emery's whole life and whole mission has all been about this climb and I thought that this would be appropriate for this gentleman right here. So I'm going to climb up this mountain. You enjoy this interview, and I'll be back right after. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, once again, coming to you high and alive. And today I come here with the simple man, <coughs> easy to know who he is. It's the Prince of Pot, Mark Emery. How are you, sir? Hey, hey. Well, actually, I've been... Uh... Probably had COVID for all I know. I've even got <laughs> rapid tests. I've even got rapid tests here, but I figure what difference does it make if I know what I've got? It's the same remedy. You have to rest and drink lots of fluids. So I've been in bed for three days drinking fluids and stuff. But actually, the first time I felt good enough to spend an hour doing something not lying in bed. So, dude, I, I am honored. Thank you so much. Now, you, yeah, had no problem. COVID. you already had COVID once before, right? I had it in Colombia. We went and got it deliberately. We had a big dinner with about 60 people. And we were at close range the whole night. And the idea was everybody was under 50. So we figured we'd all get it. And we did. And uh, everybody in the household, when I was in Columbia, that's November 2020. That was Delta. And, uh, and then we got Omicron here in the house. Um, all five of us here got it. And that's February 2022. And uh, so this is probably just a cold or a flu. In mm -hmm. fact, this was this was kind of worse than those ones but that's you know i had three flus in 2019 that were way worse than covid yeah. so uh i guess it just depends i have a bit of asthma sometimes so you know when you have these colds and flus you have breathing trouble or at least i do so you know but you know one day a flu is going to kill me but that's the way nature works i i didn't think i thought this was a very just virus i thought it was fair it killed the elderly and the weak well that's great we need those people called. That's how the planet works. You can't have old people living forever. You've got to knock them off. And if nature does it, that's justice, right? If we do it, it's evil. But if they do it, if nature does it, it's just the way the earth works. You know, it's uh, the, the world works in strange ways, as they say. Uh, you know, and it's funny because you were talking about asthma and I was, I was just talking to somebody and I was sitting with you at Spanibus in Spain when that guy came over with the, uh, the asthma S. Oh, right. And, and you know what? I've never seen that since. I've never seen it anywhere where you could get an inhaler and shoot a THC thing. It was the most genius idea. I wanted to do it in Canada and I wanted him to come up here and do it with me. But and that guy moved on. He left that company. So that idea has, I've never seen it in practice. That's well, still one of the best things ever. A cannabis inhaler. Okay, well, I'll take 5% of reminding you about that while you can create it on Wonderland <laughs> over there. That'll be wonderful. I, I, I have to be honest with you. I was I remember walking away from, from that experience with you there and and seeing the product that product and the and thinking, oh my God, is that gonna be huge? You know, yeah, that's 10, what I would have thought too. 10, 10 milligrams, 10 milligrams, yeah, I 10 know. milligrams, 10 milligrams. Thank you. I'm good. Um you know, I, I've never was, asked. And oh, I, re ahead. I remember his name too. It was Michael Terry. Five years later, I still remember that guy's name. Boom. So um, he, if he sees this, please contact me. Let's get that project underway. Yeah, I think that there, there, I saw one in Orange County in California when I was there and I reviewed it. 
Um, so there is somebody that's making one, and it, but I'll tell you that the one that we had in in Barcelona was a lot better than the one that I had that was in California. It was yeah. it was remarkably efficacious, you know. Yeah, wow. yes. I was impressed. Hey, so listen, when I saw you last, you know, I met you in Spain, but I yep. generally you're an Amsterdam guy. You right. wrote the Amsterdam Guide to Coffee Shops, right. and I bet that was a bit of a hassle because you know how people are about reviews, right? They yeah. want to run you out of town if you give them a bad review, and now you're in Portugal, and you know yeah. what? There was never really a scene there i have not been to portugal because there was nothing going on well, and you yeah. know and yet i toured ireland with uh jao gulao the minister in charge uh 20 years ago uh or the, the in charge of uh decriminalizing all the drugs mm -hmm. wonderful person and mm -hmm. i toured four irish universities with him and uh so you know portugal was making big strides 20 years ago and then he said there's no political will there to do anything else since yeah. So uh, I've been here for what, six months, I think that the coming back and forth and I've come a year before that. Um, as I understand it, you know, CBD is everywhere here. Um, the, uh, the, the That's the true with Europe generally, though. Uh, and the, the cannabis, the way it works is everything is legal here. Right. You, you could if I'm walking down the street and I've got heroin, I'm, I'm legal here selling it, though and you go to prison for six years. So right, that that, that, the, that's the, <laughs> oops, left that part out of a free open society. Uh, but everything is acquirable here. Um, but what I've learned since I've been here is that the place to go is Spain. And I was already oh, yeah. going, you know, Barcelona and I'd been through to Madrid. The place that I discovered is Huelva, South. Um, so if you go down to Andalusia uh, area and then uh, pop up over there, wow. And, and of course, Malaga is right on the other side of that, which is going to be my next exploration. But I have to tell you, they are rocking it down there. Um, really well, rocking, rocking what? Rocking like um, a, a very high um, uh, trichome dense, perfectly cured high terpene uh, buds of widespread uh, configurations. Now, okay, okay, and what's the price going for in Spain? Because Swiss Spain is expensive. Right, no, much less than Amsterdam in a lot of different, a lot of ways. Uh, you don't see a lot of the Cali, quote unquote, Cali buds in down in Huelva. Everything down there seems to be grown or cultivated there. <laughs> And from what I'm seeing, the prices are running from about eight euros up to a maximum of about 17 or 18 for the super primo. The, you for a gram? Yeah, for a gram. <laughs> you yeah, know I what? Know. Oh, wait, Five no, that's, that's a laugher. I know. In Amsterdam, it's 30, you, 30 a gram for the Cali strain. Oh, yeah, I saw that. It was, in fact, 40 when I was there. But get yeah. this. Uh, can cannabis here, good quality cannabis is about two dollars a gram U.S. I know, and, and the and the country is just swamped with it. It's the only commodity that's gone down, and it's as cheap as it was forty years ago, maybe even cheaper. And it's everywhere because in Canada, you can grow legally four plants, but a lot of people grow 10, 20, 30 plants, and the cops don't charge anybody. You can get a medical license to grow 100, 200, 500 plants, and it only costs you five hundred dollars Canadian for um, for a year. So we've got the unregulated market. That means there's thousands and thousands of people using these medical licenses to grow massive amounts to put on the market. You've got every ordinary person growing four, 10, 20, 30 plants to providing themselves. You've got native reserves. You've got the indigenous people who have their own you know, parallel system of selling incredibly good weed at super cheap prices. Then you've got the legal market with like 2000 shops across Canada um, and 800 facilities producing it. So we've got probably more cannabis per, per person in Canada than any other place in the world. So the bottom has dropped out. Nobody's making yeah. any money, not legal, not the reserves, not, uh, not the medical licensees that are selling their weed, uh, but the consumer, like for example, at the cannabis wonderland, you can get uh, seven grams for 25 Canadian, which is about 20 bucks US. Seven wow. grams for $20 US, right? And uh, and that's if you just buy seven grams. You buy an ounce, it's even cheaper. You can get an ounce on the Wonderland for 69 Canadian, which is about 55 US for an ounce, right? It hasn't been that cheap 
since 1975, yeah, right? Nearly 50, nearly 50 years ago. No, Canada has more, Oregon went through this stage. And what happens is it shakes a lot of people out because the wholesale rate for cannabis now is anywhere from uh, 350 US to 800 US a pound. And it's just not, it's not profitable for anybody to do that. And, and yet all this cannabis is just flooding the market. It's like, well, it's, the consumer is king in that regard. But that's what's happened here. Because um, there's, there's some enforcement of people who aren't legal, but not nearly enough to put a dent in either the, uh, the illegal market, the reserve market, people's private. You know, everybody's growing weed. And uh, there's no money in it. <laughs> yeah, it's the what only needs, only thing. What needs to happen? Well, I I, <laughs> I like to think that uh, they should just strip all the regulations off and let everybody go at it, right? Let the market reign, and the price um, will probably still stay low. But what's happened is the government's making they have four taxes on the legal weed that puts them in a very bad position. Both the producers and the retailers of the legal pot have tons of regulations. They can't. It's also boring. I worked at a, a legal store for two months and you've never I've never worked in such a boring environment because everything is packaged. You can't smell the weed. You can't look yeah. at the weed. You know, you can't sample the weed with them. You can't smoke it. You can't have a lounge with your weed, which is what I had when I always right. had my big illegal store where I served 2000 people a day, mm -hmm. right? We did $68,000 in business each day on average, only five years ago, right? Now we did have the best weed in the country. I used to boast, I used to yell out in the store. If anybody knows of any weed better than this, I'll give you what you buy here free. Nobody ever took me up on it because our mm -hmm. weed was incredible. But the thing is, is uh, that was kind of the golden era um, for stores because we had a lounge there. Every night we had entertainment, comedians, musicians, and we could have had a capacity of 150 people in the lounge, all smoking at one end of the building. And at this end, I had 14 people uh, full time in two shifts, 28 people total, selling weed out of jars by weight. And people loved it. They could smell it, they could look at it. And, uh, and it was all done by activists and it was all grown without any kind of corporate oversight, no taxes, no government. So these were sweet times. It was um, the blueprint. I, yeah, it was the blueprint that they ignored. Um, my Twitter, my pinned tweet on Twitter is, uh, despite the fact that I had the most popular cannabis store in the world, no governments are consulting with me on the legal cannabis industry. And it's because they want to make it uninteresting, uh, dull. You're not allowed to, like, for example, the reason the people at the Cannabis Wonderland have me on there is because I'm a well-known face. So hopefully I will be able to, you know, and I advise them on who to get and what seed sandal and <coughs> that sort of thing. Well, you can't really do that legally. I'm, you're not allowed to uh, be a brand spokesman if you're a celebrity or famous, and you're not even really allowed to, to, to promote a lifestyle. I call it the cannabis wonderland, which all yeah. it really is is just British Columbia, where all this weed is from. And yet you can't really do anything. So it's, it, the, the legal market is totally boring. There's no longer any money in it. There was three years ago when people first got into it because you know you might be the only store in your part of town. Now yeah. with 2000 stores in Canada in a country of only <coughs> say 37 million with 30 million adults, you don't need 2000 shops plus mail order in every province and you've got people growing it and you got medical licenses and you got the people, the indigenous people on in the reserve, way too much weed for 30 million people. Yeah. However, the good thing is unlike Spain and unlike Amsterdam, it's super easy for a tourist to buy weed here. You can walk into any one of 2000 shops. You can order it online. You know, once you get to your hotel, you can get it delivered. To you. It is great for tourists when they come to Canada. And that's awesome because when you go to Uruguay, they have a ton of weed, but you can't, don't, unless you know somebody, you can't find anyone in Uruguay to sell it to you. I happen to know a lot of people. So for me, there's a ton of weed. Same with Spain. You, it's, there's a rigmarole in joining a club. It's not that hard, but it's yeah. still a bit of a hassle, right? Yeah. In Amsterdam, you know, you have to go to the coffee shops and they sell to anybody, but there is no place in the world easier to buy cannabis now than Canada. And yeah. so I would now that we've got tourism, I mean, the thing is, they made cannabis legal about uh, four years ago, 
and we haven't had any tourists for two and a half years. <laughs> so we do need tourists to help absorb this massive <laughs> surplus. So come to Canada and smoke your ass off is what I say. <laughs> and it's That's cheap so too. You'll never find cannabis anywhere in the world as cheap as here. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was going to ask you a question. Um, were, were you surprised after, after all of the, the effort that you went through that once everything became legal <laughs> that I don't want to say you were swept aside, but so no, many. No, absolutely. I am because I'm not okay. even allowed in the legal industry. I'm banned. I can't own a shop in the legal industry. I can't even manage one because of my extensive criminal record. I did 40 prisons and jails for mm -hmm. cannabis. Uh, I did five years in the U S I've done six years in prisons total. I mean, you know, in the United States, people like me are the first people to get a license. Yes. Right. I was going to say, right. Not, not here, here. You're banned from getting a, if you ever had a criminal conviction, <laughs> you know, uh, you got to go through a whole bunch of scrutiny. First of all, they check where your money came from. Well, if I've been in the illegal cannabis industry all my life, where, of course, where does my money come from? Mm -hmm. But you can't launder, <laughs> you can't launder your money uh, that you made, you know, in the illegal realm into the legal realm, right? So you've got to do some con job of giving cash to your brother or whatever, or relative right. or somebody. And, and they, you know, they get all that washed that way. And that's what's happened across Canada. If anybody from the legacy industry is now in the legal industry, they've had to launder so yeah i've been swept aside i would say definitely and uh, so that's why i'm back in the illegal market uh, at least as a face a representative for a group of seed people and growers and what have you who are also not really allowed in the legal market and to, to a large degree no one wants to get into the legal market there's no money in it the investment just to have a quote micro grow you would have to invest about three quarters of a million dollars to a million and a half dollars to, to, to meet all the licensing requirements. I mean, wow. and that and that's a facility that cannot have more than 2,500 square feet of growing area. So wow. that kind of massive investment in a period where cannabis is saturated in the market, where the prices have never been lower, it's a stupid investment. Like, in fact, near me, there's a facility for sale that's $3 million that is this massive growth facility that they didn't go through with because the price has fallen through the floor. So they've got it for sale. Well, the building has all the lights in it. It's got, it's all designed to, to create weed, but nobody's buying it. Cause who's, why would you invest $3 million in something that, you know, the, the price has plummeted every other commodity that we have today, fuel, food, uh, machinery, everything is going up in price because of inflation. So you can see that if you invested in some things, the price is fairly stable. The price is not stable for cannabis. It has plummeted and it could go lower, right? Because the only way to uh, get rid of all this weed is to have people consume it. Well, that means it's got to be, we've got to increase consumption. Hence my telling tourists to come and get in on this while it's the getting is good. But, you know, uh, people will stop investing in cannabis for a while. Um, and it's kind of a crisis for the producers, but for consumers, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Now I see. Uh, right. But, but I'm not, what are your, I'm not allowed in any, in anything legal. So right. that's the problem. Yeah. So what are the options? I mean, if you're, if you're one of, I mean, is it concentrates? Is it converting to concentrates? Here's the other thing also the, the weed doesn't last forever. You, you can't and, and you can store it, but I mean, it's it's not uh, something that you can you can hold on forever. Uh, and extracts have fallen through the floor. You know, shatter here is twelve dollars US a gram retail retail. Wow. Can you imagine? That's wow. that's what it is on the Wonderland on the cannabis Wonderland. It's fifteen dollars Canadian a gram. That's twelve dollars US. I um, remember when it was seventy. The, now, here, yes, exactly. I used to sell it in my shop. For 50 and 55. I used yeah. to sell rosin, rosin for $80 a gram. It's like $25 a gram Canadian. Mm -hmm. And uh, live resin was $70 a gram. It's like $20 a gram now. So <clears throat> everything. Now, here's the thing about the legal market, too. It got screwed because although you can sell shatter, all edibles 
have to be no more than 10 milligrams of THC. So, mm. you know, it, it's bullshit, right? Because mm -hmm. the typical market is a chocolate bar has 500 milligrams or right. um, gummies have 300 milligrams in a package, right? <laughs> in the legal market, that's not at all permitted. So you've got some disparities in, in quality, um, in edibles, in topicals, um, which don't apply to the illegal, unregulated market, obviously. Um, right. the, weed, the weed can be good in the legal market, but it's expensive. For example, uh, a strain I really like, uh, Blue Dream, that's oh, yeah. uh, organic. <laughs> it's organic, but it's like $60 Canadian for an eighth, three and a half grams, right? Mm. And it's not, it hasn't come down in price. And that's not even a big markup, actually, at $60. For three and a half grams but three and a half grams you can get like for 10 bucks you know or 15 10 dollars in the regular market now maybe it's not organic you know type of stuff but still it shows you that when you buy something really good in the legal market it really costs just like in the old days maybe more so whereas the real market its prices just crashed now yeah. i'm gonna say i i noticed on uh, the Wonderland website that you're using or some of the, the growers and some of the seeds that you had uh, came from Amsterdam. Uh, you've got greenhouse oh, yeah. and, and of course my favorite Soma and you're, you've got some mango and you've got all of his, the best stuff in there. What a great call that to, and, was. And they have, a, they have to be smuggled here just like the old days, right? Wow. Because oddly enough, seeds are now legal in the United States, which is great for anybody selling them like us, you know, like the Wonderland. Um, those seeds now can be sent to the United States without being illegal. Uh, great news. That's just <laughs> a recent development in the last three weeks. So, um, but to get little them to late. Canada, but to get them to Canada, you can't do that yet. You have to kind of sneak them in. Now, seeds are easy to sneak in. And I'm an expert on it. So I can advise anybody on how to move seeds around the world. But really? the thing is, is that in Canada, even seeds are still illegal unless they're sold in a legal shop. And the legal shops only have four or five strains, right? Now, we know that there's hundreds and hundreds of strains, including Soma and uh, Greenhouse and Dynafem and Humboldt and mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other people, obviously. Um, but, that, you know, I'm still smuggling, or excuse me, did I say me? Um, they yeah. are still smuggling them um, like they were 20, 25 years ago. Wow. What's going to happen? Is there any chance that this is going to change? Uh, so there, is there a magic wand well, that's going to fix this whole thing? So much of what's going on in the world today is not sustainable. The war in the Ukraine is not sustainable. The money we're giving the Ukrainians uh, to defend themselves is not sustainable. It's up to 80 billion, 100 billion. You know, like, I mean, uh, we're wasting fabulous sums of money. We've got terrible inflation. Here in Canada, it's 8 to 10 percent. Um, and that's going to go higher. Fuel is out of the uh, skyrocketed up. Food is getting, and there's shortages of stuff everywhere. Every time I go to the supermarket, sections are all out of stuff, right? So none of this is sustainable. You can't continue to eat away at people's wages by having inflation of 8, 10, 12, 15% when they get no increase in wages or pensions or disability or, you know, this sort of thing. So there's a whole bunch of things going on that are not sustainable, including the Canadian cannabis industry can't handle four taxes, can't handle all these regulations that restrict their activities. Um, so it's not just the cannabis industry. The whole thing we're doing with socialism, uh, wokeism, government intervention, spending like crazy, government spending everywhere like crazy. Every government spending themselves into debt, except China. And China lends the money to the rest of the world for them to go into debt, which is kind of a deliberate thing they're doing to undermine the West, giving us money we shouldn't be getting uh, to subsidize all our massive deficits. So uh, none of this warfare state, welfare state, wokeist state is sustainable. So by the end of this year, I think the whole planet at least the West will be in a severe crisis. So cannabis might seem very unimportant by that time. Mm. And at the same time, you know, um, there's a real squeeze on income. So these cheaper prices have certainly been helpful. Um, but, you know, I, I worry about what's going to happen. Sure. So where are you going? Well, I'm just out here in the woods with Lara and her three daughters. And it's a wonderful, wonderful place. We have bears and deer coming here. Mm. It's a beautiful area. We don't have a car, so we don't get around much. 
and uh you know, I'm running for a city count, town council. I live in a community of ten, of 10,000 and uh, they have six councillors. And I figured, you know, I'm so contrary and <coughs> notorious as a uh, contrary and a rebel, uh, anti-government type that I might just have enough people out there. You only need about 1500 votes to get elected. I noticed that uh, the winners got between 1300 and 2,400 votes. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, I could go door to door and try and meet everybody starting in late August till the election in October. And then if I get elected, I can live on, you know, that $500 a week or whatever it is they pay you. Um, I don't need a lot to live on out here. Like I say, we don't have a car. We don't go anywhere. We just spend money on food. So in this really kind of strange way, everything you fought for, everything you wanted, everything you climbed for, you actually have right now? Well, I don't like the legal market with all its regulations. I, I was naive, though. And, and in fact, if I had advice to people, I would say don't advocate legalization because th that puts all the power in the hands of government. They take over your industry. Uh, they give it out. They give all the licenses out to big corporations. Uh, the legacy, the people who made it all happen, get nothing. Um, they're totally left out of the process. Um, it's made too expensive for them to get in deliberately. Right. It's made too regulated for them to get in deliberately. Um, it's handed off to, you know, <coughs> there are at least 20 cops from the head of the drug squad of the RCMP, our National Police Force, to major cities drug squad office, to chiefs of police who now are presidents of cannabis companies, right? Yeah. And and so that happened. And then politicians, you know, the last three, you know, prime ministers are on cannabis boards of directors, just actually in a lot of ways, just to help them raise more money. You know, yeah. they use, oh, look, we've got ex-prime minister john turner on our board of directors right yeah. and they use that as a way of of a credibility to raise more money um and i might point out that all these big corporations that they handed licenses to have never made money in fact they've lost billions the biggest ones canopy growth aurora tilray have probably lost two to three billion dollars but of other people's money certainly not the guys who started the company that's for sure they all mm. retired like bandits right and that's what happens you you put it in the hands of the greedy corporations the greedy cops the greedy bureaucrats they hired thousands of extra bureaucrats in ottawa in our capital to to process all this so it's a big job creation program literally for all the people that hated on cannabis for their whole lives up until it was legalized and then the industry was handed over to all of them mm -hmm. and that's going to happen in every country so i would tell people don't advocate legalization advocate that they stop arresting us because once they stop arresting us that's all you want Right. If people are still being arrested, you still have prohibition. We still have people being arrested in Canada who are operating outside of the regulations. So we still have prohibition. What we do have is exceptions called licenses. And uh, and that's what we have. The only thing you can do without any regulation is grow those four plants. Right. Everything else is regulated. And if it's regulated to the degree of exclusion, it's not legalization anyway, as I see it. It's uh, it's prohibition with exceptions. So did I get, I got about half of what I wanted. I got it yeah. so anybody can grow. I got it so medical people can grow a lot. I got it so that you could have a store in a very boring, sterile industry. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> there are no lounges in my day. You know, cannabis culture still has a lounge in downtown Vancouver. Uh, good for them um, that they're still putting, you know, going on. Two years of COVID was horrible for their business, though, right? Because you couldn't open lounges where people are blowing smoke and congregating. Um, and so that killed a lot of momentum. Um, yeah. All that, you know, and, and of course, it was hysteria, right? We're all getting COVID anyway. That's what's funny. We should have all got it in the first three to six months, got it over with and moved on instead people are still getting covid two and a half years later right yeah. it's basically now about two-thirds of canada ever has had covid right so uh, the the rest of it will get it by this year well then and all, so all, all that done. well yeah until the next one comes along because too many people made money off of it like yeah. the uh the big the big box retailers amazon 
you know, all these, those people made lots of money while everybody else suffered, right? Bureaucrats made, they get to work from home. How sweet. Who's mm. monitoring your quality of output when you're at home, right? <laughs> Nobody. Um, so, you know, if you're a bureaucrat or a professional and you can work from home, you made out like a bandit. If you're some, you know, wage slave working in a small business, you got locked out of your job for three to six months, right? Mm. And then the government gave out so much free money um, that is causing this inflation we have now. All that money being given out to people who weren't making anything caused shortages because we're still eating and shitting and consuming, but not producing anything. And that's what causes inflation. Too much mm. money for too few goods. And we yeah. still have these supply chain shortages. It's very bizarre. It is. You know, you were mentioning your, your, uh, your, your spot, the original spot on Hastings Street. And I have still so there. many... I have so many fond memories from that place. Uh, you know, I, li I lived on Vancouver Island for 10 years and I used to come across on the ferry. And as soon as oh, yeah, beat, this bro. was long before anything was legal. And the first thing you did was go over to the park that was across the street from you. Right. And that's usually where the first where, 420 was. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. and you could find all the, usually there was somebody there that had some fud or there was like four or five yeah. different hidden spots that are all around the neighborhood. And then you'd come over to your spot. And in and the first, uh, I remember the first volcano vaporizer you had in there. Yeah, you had the vaporizer lounge going on. Lots and lots and lots of wonderful. Yeah, hours, that's so. that started in January two thousand and six, and it started as a project because my seed business had been busted by DEA RCMP, and we needed something to do to keep it lively because the seeds were a big kind of exchange. Growers would come by, seed people. It was a real happening environment. So when that all got put out of business, we needed something to do that was exciting. So at first, we just put a chair and a volcano and charge people two bucks to use it. And then it got popular. And eventually, you know, we have three floors of lounges. The main floor is a lounge now at Cannabis Culture, as well as the second and third floor. So it's all lounge now. That's outrageous. Have you seen any flower in the last couple of years you know, boutique flower, something special that really blew your mind. I, you well, know, you've seen so much, so well, it's hard. And people always ask me, what are my favorite strains? But mm -hmm. the truth is I have no favorite strains. I have favorite growers because mm -hmm. a great grower makes everything good. Yes. But a mediocre grower ruins the stuff I say I like, right? So like if I, I could tell you um, peyote cookies, or uh, which is an odd name for cannabis, but there's a beautiful string called peyote cookies out there. Well, I saw a grower do a wonderful job recently, uh, burned like a dream, it turned white, um, all the great things that had a, it cut through anything else I'd been smoking previously, right? But those guys just know how to grow that strain well. Somebody else growing it could fuck it up and I wouldn't notice it at all. And, and also there's a, a number of diseases out there now. There's kind of like a, almost like uh, there's some kind of tobacco uh, virus or some kind of virus that originally affected tobacco that's now affecting uh, cannabis. And it reduces resin production. It weakens the resin production. Things like that are, are of concern, mm -hmm. right? Like when you have a, an endemic diseases that affect pot and you never really, so you have to be careful about what you're getting in that regard, right? Um, that That's happening, but uh uh, you know, generally it's growers. I, I don't, strains come and go and there's so many, you know, flavors of the day anymore. Like I like peanut butter breath. I thought that mm. was really strong. I've had some of that recently. Um, some of the latest stuff coming out of California or Amsterdam are great with when they're grown by a great grower, right? Yes. So, you know, I, I used to think Skittles was great. I used to buy it in Amsterdam. Wonderful strains I got at, uh, What's the name? A family first, I think, was where I used to buy my stuff. Excellent right? choice. I, I, yeah, I like that place. And uh, they were always like 12 to 15 euros a gram. <laughs> and, you know, that's worth it for really good weed because you don't smoke that much really good weed. And so I found Skittles was terrific there. Um, wedding cake, I really liked. But you know what? I've had wedding cake elsewhere and it was totally nothing. Right. Yeah. Um, I had so mango. Uh, Soma so mango oh. in Spain. In Spain, at one place was awesome, and then at another place, grown by somebody else, wasn't so awesome, right? Okay. So ultimately, there's so many wonderful strains out there. 
No, they're all knockoffs of each other. I mean, it's not like people are bringing stuff out of the jungle uh, for the first time and getting it out there and we're having revelations, right? Maybe right. the Congolese at one time would qualify for that, something out of the Congo. Um, I'll tell you, one of the places I went to where the pot was really awesome and almost all the growers did a good job was South Africa. Where? And they were all, when Specifically. I toured, well, well, the best place to go really would be Cape Town. And that's because right. there's a good cannabis scene in Cape Town. Um, it doesn't necessarily come from there, but that's the place to acquire some. Now, I spent three weeks in South Africa uh, touring the coast from uh, Cape Town right around to the Trans Sky to Durban. And then I went inland to uh, Johannesburg. And I was accompanied by the most wonderful man, uh, Jules Stobbs, who was murdered um, mm. a, a year and a half ago uh, in a horrible way. And when he was with me, uh, bandits and uh, killers broke into his home and terrorized his wife and other people on the property, but left just stealing things. Um, and they asked where Jules was at the time. And then uh, so we got back uh, to home two days after that. And then uh, six months later, um, people broke in and uh they came back and they killed him and i oh. believe that was a political i believe that was a political killing i believe there was probably some instigation there and that's the only problem with south africa is that a lot of the white people there consider it unsafe yeah. um but it's a, it's a beautiful place the the people i met and i will tell you uh, by and large i met white people because uh, they're the people that speak English. They're the people that uh, are into the cannabis industry type of thing. And, you know, they were all my friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the people I met in South Africa were just wonderful. They had wonderful cannabis. That's a tremendous area to grow it in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, although I do love Colombia, I would love to live in South Africa. I, I, I'd rather, really? I'd rather, yeah, because Canada's turned into kind of a dystopia. Um, you know, I've kind of had it with this country. I'm not even legally allowed to board a plane here. And it's been that way for eight months because I'm unvaccinated, right? I, oh. I don't trust this vaccine. I never had a problem with vaccines before. In fact, when I went to South oh. Africa, I had to get a yellow fever vaccination. But those kind of vaccinations are good because they're sterilizing vaccines. Once you get a yellow fever vaccination, you don't get yellow fever. You don't spread yellow fever. You're never going to see yellow fever. It doesn't right. matter if, if, and if I'm with you, it doesn't matter if you have it because i've got it i'm protected right. whereas this dumb <coughs> this stupid covid thing right uh you know you get five shots and it still doesn't prevent you from getting it it still doesn't prevent you from spreading it it's such a bullshit vaccine that the world has spent fabulous sums on again unsustainably large sums on a bullshit vaccine that does nothing at all right we've had so much propaganda over something that's not nearly as deadly as so many things in our history. Um, you know, the poor people with cannabis who had their, or sorry, with cancer who had their surgery put off to mm -hmm. deal with these COVID people. I mean, yeah. we, you know, I, 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 you know, maybe I'm not sentimental, but I just don't think we should worry about when people 80, 90 years old die of a, an organic virus, like, you know, a flu virus or a COVID virus or, you know, like, you know that's the way it goes don't worry about it one day it's going to kill me it might kill me now <laughs> <laughs> might you might not make it to you, the end of the, the, the right. interview you can, you can say this was mark's final interview <laughs> that he literally like died shortly after doing this uh interview I'll, and, and, I'll, that, and, and that's and fine I'll, with me because i'm not afraid to die i mean if i was afraid to die i wouldn't have gone to 40 different prisons and jails for yeah. cannabis right i yeah. wouldn't have let myself get extradited i wouldn't have done any of that stuff and, and i'm surprised how many elderly people are afraid to die in their 70s and 80s what the fuck yeah. are you waiting for you, you know? know a quick question because you brought it up and, and it's one of those things that you know i've known about for years and years and years but i've never really asked you about and and we've never talked about it and i guess this is as good a place as any but you know when you went to jail you didn't really need to go to jail I mean, you you took the fall, and you're the, there was other people that were involved with that with you, right? Yeah, right. That's true. But I did need to go to jail. Um, it started out they wanted twenty eight to forty years for me, and uh -huh. ten years each for for Michelle and Greg. Right now, let's face oh. it, because when I got sentenced finally to five years, 
you know, that when they went to the judge, they said, Your Honor, Mr. Emery is responsible for producing more marijuana than any other individual or organization ever be brought before a court in the United States of America. God. So when, when, when they start saying that, you feel you feel grateful that you feel grateful that you're not going to get 20 30 40 100 years right like i was grateful for five wow. because when <clears throat> they had all my records they had all my boasts i would boast we sent three million seeds to the united states well that's going to be used against you in court and it was <laughs> yeah right? so they said they said not only has he produced possibly uh you know several tens of thousands of tons of cannabis but he will he will continue to be responsible for that in the decades to come because mm. people will take cuttings and clones and they will spread it around and so mr emery's efforts will go on in perpetuity <laughs> so he can so in a way they said he will continue to offend even while we lock him up right too late he's already done it, it. Was, because because I've only been convicted of one thing, and that's conspiracy to manufacture marijuana in the United States of America, right? right. The one count, one count, but it was a big count, three <laughs> million seeds. And I always, I, I I wanted to snicker when the the prosecuting attorney said three million seeds, and my lawyer got up and said yes, but only half of those would be female, so it's really only a million and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm sorry. It's it's funny, but it's not funny. You got fucked so well, hard it, there, dude. It's, it's it, well, it's I don't one of those that. things, I, I, you know. As as we spoke earlier, though, I had a very rewarding time in prison. I was in a, the prison rock band, and we played 180 songs over three years. And by the way, I have no talent, so the the band just liked me. Here's a funny story, though. Okay, so this was a wonderful band. I used to follow them. I'd, I'd have people send music books to them and they would play, you know, stuff I just loved. And then one day they came in and said, we got to get a new bass player. And I said, oh yeah, what happened? They said, well, you know, Cameron always seemed to have lots of tobacco. Well, he pissed hot at a urine test the other day. Oh. And, and he said there was heroin in his system. So he got taken away. And I said, I said, and apparently it's the pastor that's bringing heroin into the prison along with tobacco <laughs> in exchange for sex. And I'm going, what? Yeah. <laughs> I said, so, so he said, Cameron was giving a blow job to the pastor in exchange for drugs. Oh and I go, God. what? I said, how do you know all this? I said, well, they'll just put you in solitary and squeeze you. You'll be there for months until you tell them how you got heroin. Right. And oh. as soon as you tell them, you know, you'll get transferred to a new prison, but you'll be allowed to have a regular life again. So eventually everybody cracks. Oh, and wow. then one day, and then and, and then one day we saw the pastor being escorted out of the prison in handcuffs. They didn't charge him because the word of an inmate versus a pastor in a court is not going to be great. Right. But they wanted to make a demonstration to humiliate him to at least let him know that we know what you've been doing. So. So anyway, they needed a new bass player. <laughs> I said, who are you going to get? And they said, well, we think you should be the bass player. I said, yes, but I, I have no talent. I worked in the guitar shop because I was trustworthy. And so a lot of guys need guitar E-strings uh, for their tattooing guns, which they do at night with the barbering material that they use during the day at the mm -hmm. barber shop. So they came in and they said, well, we think you should be the bass player. And I, I said, really? And they said, yeah, we believe we can teach you how to play. And I go, well, really? And he said, yeah. He said, we think we can have you uh, with eight songs for the next show we have to do on July 4th in six weeks. I go, six weeks? He said, yeah, wow. we think if you work two or three hours every day, we can teach you at least eight songs. And then from there, you know, you'll build up. And that's exactly wow. what happened. I played uh, eight songs on bass. Uh, six weeks later. And Do you remember the, the eight week, songs? Oh, yes. Johnny Be Good. And that was the last song. And they made a joke. They, they, they doubled the tempo and then doubled it again to, to see if I could recognize it when the drummer <laughs> picked up the... And uh, <coughs> um, oddly enough, Tightrope by Stevie Ray Vaughan. Hey Joe mm -hmm. by Jimi Hendrix. Um, I'm trying to think what else. We, eventually we do seven Hendrix songs three Stevie Ray Vaughan songs. I mean, we're doing Van Halen. I did uh, uh, Come Together by the Beatles, uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash by the Stones. Now, some of them were complex. It took me 30 days to learn Texas Flood by Stevie Ray Vaughan. It took me probably a month to learn uh, Livin' Lovin' Made Heartbreaker by Led Zeppelin. Uh, some of those bass players were really good. 
and they were complex. Yes. The, the who was your play, Who is your lead guitarist? Here's the thing. In prison, there are all sorts of geniuses there who get fucked up on drugs and alcohol and women and end up in prison for 10, 20 years for something stupid, like robbing a bank. And, uh, and they were just amazing. A prison is full of artist geniuses, uh, creative geniuses, uh, musical geniuses, uh, just amazing people. And so they, they, not only did they teach me, but <coughs> I, and we had a fully electric studio too at this prison. 20% of the inmate trust funds. By the way, the taxpayer doesn't pay for any of that. It's all the inmate trust funds that come from their spending at the commissary. All the profits made at the commissary are used to buy inmate equipment, basketballs, pool tables, exercise. But in this prison, 20% of the budget went to the music program. <laughs> so they had 40 guitars. They had a fully electric studio, right, with pedals. And it was just incredible. So we mm -hmm. could crank out. I remember how much fun it was to play something like, hey, Joe, I shot her, I shot her down, right? <laughs> That's one of the lines. Of the <laughs> and a bunch of fucking prisoners in, in prison uniforms just rocking out to stuff like that. That blew my mind. Um, and so I had a very rewarding experience. Um, I could always practice music in prison. I could always, you know, I had tabulature coming in. So that, that's a truly wonderful time in my life. I'm still in touch with almost all the members of the band. Wow. You know, it's funny. I, I was in touch with, uh, I, I saw Tommy Chong right after he got out of prison and he had a prison similar was the, prison. Prison was the best thing that ever happened to Tommy because before yeah. that I thought his career was waning. I hated that character, Leo on that 70s show. I just hated that character. And, uh, and he was in a malaise. Uh, you know, Tommy's from West Vancouver, and I would see him, seen him many, many times. Wonderful man. And although he's blocked me on Twitter because he hates Trump, right? And I thought uh, Trump is way preferable than Biden. Tommy's such mm -hmm. a woke Democrat. But, but that's notwithstanding that. Um, mm -hmm. Once he went to jail, he wrote a book, the Each I Chong. I which Chong. Is a great book. Yeah. 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 And the guy who wrote Wolf of Wall Street was actually his cellmate. And that, that guy wrote two great books because of Tommy's advice, right? Which was, whatever your book is about, write all the over-the-top stories, all the outrageous stories, sort of the stuff I tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Just put your, that all together in a book of all your outrageous stories and all your conflicts. The same thing a reality show specializes in. There's no reality show about people who get along and are nice to each other. Right. All reality <laughs> shows are about people who don't get along don't know how to be civilized rude mm -hmm. to each other and because because it makes the audience feel superior for one which is important mm -hmm. for a reality show and but they're secondly, having se and or they're having sex it. with each other well yeah but it doesn't matter the sex is always fraught with problems H have people having sex with each other in and of itself would not be attractive on a reality show but people mm -hmm. having awkward sex bad sex um uh <laughs> misunderstood sex um mm -hmm. anything like that that's Drunk where there's going to be drama <laughs> but even that sounds pleasant and relatively uncomplicated, right? Yeah. You know, you mentioned Tommy Chong. I'm I'm curious. I mean, you you were in Vancouver for a long time. You've met millions of people. What's what do you have a most memorable celebrity interaction? Is there uh, yeah, I, I I hung out with Woody Harrelson on a, a maybe a dozen times, and that was always very enjoyable. Lovely man. Um John Cusack was funny because he wasn't really into uh, cannabis at all. In fact, he refused joints and stuff like that. And uh, I don't it's not right to disclose what kind of drugs famous people are into. No, no, no. Um, but John Cusack was into something that was legal, but strange, right? Okay, it was mm -hmm. nitrous oxide. Oh, right? He loves cool. nitrous. Ah, right? how and he cool was that? He, <laughs> he just Poppers. hung out by himself and did nitrous. Oh, uh, well, in Canada, you can buy them legally. So we got him a can canister. And <laughs> with the little balloon? With the little I remember balloon. when Owen Wilson came by for a night, we gave him MDMA because he Ow. tried to kill him. He, try, he commits, tried to commit suicide six weeks earlier. And he oh. was in Vancouver doing Marley and Me with Jennifer Aniston. 
and mm-hmm. such a sweet person. But he was a really sweet person when we gave men DFA. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> the wrestler Rob Van Dam was fascinating. Um, he used to tell me how he used to smoke weed to deal with injuries, pain, and all that when he's wrestling. And even though it's semi-scripted wrestling, you know, that kind of semi-scripted, it's still risky. They all break bones and limbs and strains and stuff. Because, you know, they have to jump on each other and they got to get it right. Yeah. <clears throat> or they really will hurt themselves or hurt each other, right? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I've met so many people. Including yeah, I, I smoked with I smoked weed with the prime minister. Um, now he denies this, but there are witnesses, and Justin? so whenever anybody, yeah. When when was this? This was in uh, July two thousand and four, at a restaurant on Broadway, um, with uh, and we were all alumni of a thing called Idea City. We all spoke this sort of it's like TED Talks and, and we all spoke at Idea City. And with me was an astrophysicist who loved hash and uh, my friend Laura St. John, who was a prodigy at the time. And now 20 years later, she's world famous as a violinist and performs everywhere. She still sends me a card every Christmas, oh, uh, which has pic- pictures of all the places she's performed at in the previous year. And uh, she doesn't smoke pot. She drank wine at that event. But they were both there when the prime minister, who was not the prime minister at the time, in mm-hmm. fact, he was just a, a drama teacher, which is all he really is, mm-hmm. um, back in 2004. Who knew that guy would be prime minister? You could bl- it, it astonishes me. Uh, he was wholly unequipped to be prime minister. Now, when, um, when, 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 when he ran, though, you were, you supported him, didn't you, when he first Oh, yeah, ran? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's my big mistake because I got a legalization that's an abortion. Um, I ended up committing this country and, and we got a lot of people to vote for him that election. Yeah, um, I and, remember. Uh, you know, all, all the pot people did and, and it was enough to swing the, the election. He was third and then moved up to first and, and won that election. But the, <laughs> the legalization was terrible. And what he's done to the country since then is abhorrent. Mm-hmm. He's turned into such a maniacal dictator and uh, really brought this country on the brink of ruin, I think. So, I mean, when you when a guy like me wants to move to South Africa, right, <laughs> uh, I mean, something's gone wrong with Canada. I talked about that fairy wand before. I'm going to I'll give it to you again. Let's make you completely prime minister now. Seriously. And really seriously, because you you have a, you have very strong opinions about about a lot of elements of the government, not just the cannabis element. What needs to oh, yeah. change? What would you well, do first? I mean, the decriminalization really... is first, Okay. Right? Well, first of all, all drugs would be decriminalized, right? And, uh, and we'd give out, uh, we'd give people permission to sell them. The, the law requirements there would be, it has to be what you say it is. So if this is a drug you're marketing as such, you just have to prove that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Test it you know, pr- publish it, but uh, you can't lie about your drugs. But uh, we wouldn't, I wouldn't prohibit them. But basically, I would also get rid of democracy. Uh, representative democracy is stupid, doesn't work. Nobody represents you. They represent the prime minister or the party or something. <clears throat> we don't need democracy. I mean, if you wanted, we could vote on everything from our home and our computers on a phone. There you uh, go. Anything, right? But I don't oh. trust that either. I don't yeah. want my fellow citizens having control over my life anyway. Oh. So I don't think you should be able to vote on my abortions or my drug consumption or my tax rate. I think we should just pay for everything we use. So if we drive, we pay for the roads, right? Or if we don't drive, whoever has a vehicle pays for the roads, right? Um, if I want anything, it should be paid for. I'm against socialism. I'm against collectivization. And ultimately, I'm in favor of freedom, not democracy. Democracy leads us away from freedom. It usually leads to more socialism, more control, more bureaucracy. Um, ultimately, I would undo government. I would get rid of it because we need we need controlling mechanisms, but we need them controlled by the people who have a vested interest in them, not bureaucrats, not soulless politicians who make policy based on whether they can be popular in the next six months to two years with those policies. So unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Um, I don't get a lot of votes when I run for office. Um, I'm a popular person to stand up for justice and freedom, but I, they, they wouldn't trust me 
uh, because people are frightened of upheaval and I, I would have to upheave it. If I only even had one term, I would try and do all the radical shit in the first six months so that we've got four years for people to get used to it before I get kicked out of office, right? <laughs> so the, you know, that, that's the thing, right? Democracy is, doesn't work. Mm. Um, it's, it's out of date. For a technologically advanced society like ours, democracy has no place anymore, right? It's not like 150 years ago where that guy is going traveling thousands of miles to Ottawa to speak on our behalf because there's no other way possible, right? There were almost no laws 150 years ago anyway. <laughs> what there were laws were for the railroads or for building roads or the military or something. Um, and even then, the military is badly used in Canada historically in the Boer War and the horrible First World War. We shouldn't have been there. So mm -hmm. representative democracy, I don't think works. I I'm certain it doesn't work. Um, they say it's a bad system, but it's the best one we've come up with. No, we haven't. We've come up with anarchy. We've come up with minimized, minimal government, constitutional government. Um, and for example, the United States is such a mess. Way too much government, way too much intervention, way too much control over people's lives. Government is not competent to do anything. Government lies in every aspect of its existence. So therefore, larger government means more lies, more malfeasance, more things going wrong. We need a lot less government and we need to break it apart as, as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible and return control to individuals who have a vested interest in the outcome. And if you don't have a vested interest in the outcome, then, you know, I, first of all, I think everything woke is wrong. You know, there are no trans kids, right? There are, there's no, we should never have critical race theory. We shouldn't have any kind of like socialism. We shouldn't have any kind of government intervention in people's personal lives and economic lives. There's just so many things wrong. And we're starting to see the evidence of these terrible things now with inflation. Leaving government in charge of the control of money is a terrible idea. For example, when I went across Canada with my family on a holiday in 1967, gasoline in Canada was 33 cents a gallon. Now it's $10 Canadian a gallon. <coughs> That's an increase of 35 times over the space of 55 years. So money is constantly every year being devalued because it's controlled by government. You know, if it would be different with a gold certificate or some kind of guaranteed, you know, exchange in a commodity so that it doesn't lose its value. But everything government touches is a lie. Everything government says is a lie. Everything government does is, neg is a negative, right? Well, people say, well, you've got socialized medicine. Yeah, but it's, it's taken up half of all my tax money. And I've never been in a hospital in my entire adult life for anything, right? I've never used the socialized medical services in Canada. Yeah, they're there if I need them. Are they? I don't know. I'm a lot of people were had their cancer surgeries delayed six months because they were understaffed because of COVID allegedly. But I look at it, that's what happens when the government looks after your healthcare system. It's gonna fall apart, right? Whenever government looks after anything, it's gonna be costly, inefficient, and ultimately it's not gonna satisfy you. And we're reaching that critical point now. Would, would I be right in assuming that you would be a fan of crypto? No, because crypto, for example, uh, on October 5th, I got given $4.20 Canadian in Bitcoin cash. Uh, the other night it was worth $1.10, uh -huh. right? It's nearly gone down four times in value. Now, that means billions and billions of people's money disappeared in the thin fucking air because of those massive devaluations, right? So if you think inflation of 8, 10, 12% is bad, how about inflation of four times? Like in other words, I spent $4.20 in October and now it's worth a dollar ten. Yeah. Like nothing nothing else plummeted that low. Stocks have come down 20%. <clears throat> but those stocks at least are something real. Crypto isn't real. It's just like NFTs. It's total bullshit. Anybody who spends $10 on an NFT is a fool because it's like this. Crypto doesn't really exist. Now, they might say that about fiat money too. But with fiat money, I can go buy an asset. And even if the house you buy doesn't go up in value, at least you can live in it. You can use it. You can enjoy life in it. <sighs> <laughs> Same with any kind of commodity. I can buy a television, a phone, and they do stuff for me. They're serving me all day long. What does crypto do when you buy it? Nothing. 
right? It's, it's an investment, but why not invest in something real that exists, that forms, serves a function in our society? Crypto doesn't do any of that, nor do NFTs. It's just a fraud. It's a big hoax, right? And it may go up or down in value, but it still doesn't make it legitimate, nor would I ever recommend it because you can lose it all within weeks or months. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not an investment. Something that volatile is not an investment. It's gambling. And that's all it is, Graham. So no, I'm not, against, I'm not in favor of crypto. I think crypto mining is a stupid idea, right? I think we need to return to a, a currency that's just simply got something backing it, like a metal, gold, a commodity, grain, or, or a combination of all of them. And that way, if the price of food went up or the price of gold went up, the value of your certificate that you have goes up with it. There you go, I made it. Unbelievable, what an amazing climb this was. I love this game, and I love that interview with Mark Emery. Wow, I learned so many cool new things I never knew about him before. Anyway, that's our show for today. Oh yeah, there's one more thing. Hit it. It's Danny again, Cap. Again, thank you for letting me come on the show. Super appreciate it. Um, I wanted to talk about really a strain that I'm actually a big fan of here that we carry um, at our dispensary. It's called Hell's OG. Um, it's a great indica. Um, great thing about this that I particularly like. Um, it's great for pain, uh, PTSD, inflammation. Uh, I have a chronic condition, so anything that's going to help with my inflammation is always a winner for me. Um, it smells to me very earthy. A little bit on the back end, there's like a kind of like a citrusy kind of smell to it, which, you know, you can't really fight that. Um, genetics on Hell's OG is going to be Blackberry and OG Kush. Let me show it to you. Look at those nuggets. Beautiful. Beautiful. Big fan. So, that said, if you're ever out in Missouri and you want to check out some good flour, stop by our dispensary and check out some Hell's OG from Terrapin. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's Danny Raposo, a.k.a. The Stoner Chef. Today on the Bud Report, here we are. It's Monday, and I'm smoking. Ooh, look at that. Gorilla Glue 4. Yes, Gorilla Glue 4, guys. It is from... Uh, here, let me turn... The Bud Quad... Uh, BC Quad Shop in Montreal, once again. Thank you, guys. Uh, awesome dispensary on the native land out in the Oka Reserve uh, in Montreal. And it is, let's see, 31% THC flavors, chemical, cocoa, coffee, diesel, pine, and it's very sweet. I'm telling you, it's very sweet. Very nice, bud. Um, yeah, uh, I can't wait to uh, try this in an edible, uh, but yeah. That's what I'm smoking this week for the Worldwide Bud Report for Captain Hooter in Lisbon, Portugal. Have a great day, guys, and put it in the air. Hi, smokers and vapors. Herb here, and today I'm going to do things a little bit different. Normally, I do a bud report of a uh, bud I found in a coffee shop after smelling the whole range that they have. But this week, I was at coffee shop Baba, one of the better coffee shops in Amsterdam because they won multiple coffee shop of the year awards and I saw that they had a specific deal on the menu now you gotta know I'm a sucker for a good deal 
And there at Baba I found a great deal for a strain called Purple Kosher. And this was only 12 euros a gram. So I decided, why not? I'll just do the challenge and I'll pick it up. I'll pick up two grams for 12 euros a gram and I will go and check it out without smelling it. So this is not a butt report. This is a butt review. You ready? Here we go. So let's talk about bag appeal first. Uh, this nog, it, had, it looked massive. It was a real good solid chunk of BLM, broadleaf marijuana. Definitely had a lot of foxtails. It looked freaky in a good way. Yet yeah, the color was a bit disconcerting for me because it was, it had this little bit of a gray sheen all over it. And also the green wasn't as green as I hoped. It was very dark and it had a lot of brown in it as well. A little bit too much brown for my taste. And on the inside of the nug, I could see a little bit more of that yellowish green that might indicate a little bit of a nutrient burn or overfeeding. So that also uh, gave me a little bit of pause. And the last thing that I saw was also that there were little chunks um, where I think seeds used to be. There's like these holes in the nug where um, it appeared to have had some seeds. Now I picked out some of these things that looked like seeds. I don't know if they're actually were seeds. They looked a bit like underdeveloped seeds. So it could be a very uh, hard uh, brecht or uh, klaxi, like a little piece of flower. It could be a seed, I don't know. Anyway, so the the way that the nug looked uh, was a bit comprehensive. Yet, let's carry on. The aroma, however, was beautiful. So let's talk about that. Oh man, that's super gassy and very, very spicy, like heavy spice. It also has a very present undertone of lavender something really flowery uh, there's also a heavy heavy herbaceousness it's almost like i'm uh, smelling hash here it's uh, definitely chock full of uh, linenol and uh, carofoline i'm sure of it this is going to knock me off my feet or at least put me to sleep i'm sure of it This is going to hit me hard. I can already feel it rushing through my body with a heavy body load. And yeah, my head is already getting cloudy. So this is definitely a strain you want to use for after work, uh, in the evening or before bedtime. Because otherwise you're going to be out of the game. So if I have to give this a score, I would say a small seven due to the things that I saw on the inside of the bud. The possible overfeeding, the possible nutrient burn, uh, the possibility of seeds being present. Yeah, no, I don't think that's uh, something you would like to see. But the aroma and the flavor and the effect were on par. So yeah, I can't go higher than a seven, but it would have been higher if the bud didn't look suspicious. So that's it for now. I'll see you at the next bud report. Bye. Thank you for listening. Okay, that's it for our show, everybody. I've got to climb all the way up to that thing before I'm out of here today, and I don't know if I can do it. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. All right. Anyway, I'll see you guys next on Wednesday when I'm going to be back with a brand new show and a brand new worldwide bud report. Uh-oh. I don't like the way this looks. Uh oh. Uh oh. Um. Okay. Well, I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Uh, ah!
<laughs> it's Captain Hooter.